Perhaps the present masters of the planet would have had ancestors who were tunicates. We might not have evolved. Someone else, someone very different, would be here now in our stead, maybe pondering their origins. But that's not what happened. There was a particular sequence of environmental accidents and random mutations in the hereditary material. One particular timeline for life on Earth in this universe. As a result, the dominant organisms on the planet today come from fish. Along the way, many more species became extinct than now exist. If history had a slightly different weave, some of those extinct organisms might have survived and prospered. But occasionally, a creature thought to have become extinct hundreds of millions of years ago turns out to be alive and well. The coelacanth, for example. For three and a half billion years, life had lived exclusively in the water. But now, in a great breathtaking adventure, it took to the land. But if things had gone a little differently, the dominant species might still be in the ocean, or they might have developed spaceships to carry them off the planet altogether. From our ancestors, the reptiles, there developed many successful lines, including the dinosaurs. Some were fast, dexterous, and intelligent. A visitor from another world or time might have thought them the wave of the future. But after nearly 200 million years, they were suddenly all wiped out. Perhaps it was a great meteorite colliding with the Earth, spewing debris into the air, blotting out the sun and killing the plants that the dinosaurs ate. I wonder when they first sensed that something was wrong. The successors of the dinosaurs came from the same reptilian stock, but they were able to survive the catastrophe that destroyed their cousins. Again, there were many branches which became extinct. And again, had events been only a little different, those branches might have led to the dominant form today. For 40 million years, a visitor would not have been much impressed by these timid little creatures, but they led to all the familiar mammals of today. And that includes the primates. About 20 million years ago, a space-time traveler might have recognized these guys as promising. Bright, quick, agile, sociable, curious. Their ancestors were once atoms made in stars. Then simple molecules, single cells, polyps stuck to the ocean floor, fish, amphibians, reptiles, shrews. But then they came down from the trees and stood upright. They grew an enormous brain. They developed culture, invented tools, domesticated fire. They discovered language and writing. They developed agriculture. They built cities and forged metal. And ultimately, they set out for the stars from which they had come five billion years earlier. We are star stuff, which has taken its destiny into its own hands. The loom of time and space works the most astonishing transformations of matter. Our own planet is only a tiny part of the vast cosmic tapestry, a starry fabric of worlds yet untold. Those worlds in space are as countless as all the grains of sand and all the beaches of the Earth. Each of those worlds is as real as ours. In every one of them, there's a succession of incidents, events, occurrences, which influence its future. Countless worlds, numberless moments, an immensity of space and time. And our small planet, at this moment, here we face a critical branch point in history, 
What we do with our world right now will propagate down through the centuries and powerfully affect the destiny of our descendants. It is well within our power to destroy our civilization and perhaps our species as well. If we capitulate to superstition or greed or stupidity, we can plunge our world into a darkness deeper than the time between the collapse of classical civilization and the Italian Renaissance. But we are also capable of using our compassion and our intelligence, our technology and our wealth to make an abundant and meaningful life for every inhabitant of this planet, to enhance enormously our understanding of the universe and to carry us to the stars. In our motorbike sequence, we showed how the landscape might look if we were barreling through it at close to the speed of light. Since then, inspired by this sequence, Ping Kang Seung at Carnegie Mellon University produced an exact computer animation. This is what you'd see if you were traveling at ordinary speeds through this red and white lattice. But this is how it would appear if you were traveling the same route at close to the speed of light. We're probably many centuries away from traveling close to the speed of light and experiencing time dilation. But even then, it might not be fast enough if we wanted to travel to some distant place in the galaxy, say, and then come back to Earth in our own epoch. Some years after completing Cosmos, I uh, found myself taking time out from my scientific work to write a novel, uh, a novel about travel to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I was willing to imagine beings and civilizations uh, far more advanced than we, but I wasn't willing to ignore the laws of physics. Was there, even in principle, a way to get very quickly to uh, 30,000 light years from Earth? So I put this question to my friend Kip Thorne of the California Institute of Technology. He's a leading expert on the nature of space and time. Kip thought about it for a while and then uh, answered with about 50 lines of equations, which showed that a really advanced civilization might establish and hold open wormholes, which uh, we might think of as tubes through the fourth dimension, which connect the Earth with another place in the universe without having to traverse the intervening distance, something like crawling through a wormhole in an apple. I was very happy with this result, and I used it as a key plot device in, in contact. But such wormholes through space would also be time machines, it seemed to me. And I used that notion in, in my novel Contact as well. Kip Thorne and his colleagues later proved, or so it seemed, that time travel of this sort was possible. Here, look at this. The key question being explored now is whether such time travel can be done consistently with causes preceding effects, say, rather than following them. Does nature contrive it so that even with a time machine, you can intervene to prevent your own conception, for example? Even if time travel of this sort is really possible, it's far in our technological future. But maybe other beings, much more advanced than we, are voyaging to the far future in the remote past, not a measly 40 years ago on Earth, but to witness the death of the sun, say, or the origin of the cosmos. <laughs>